All right, here we go. Okay, so the the CDC does tease out some of this information, but a lot of it has to do with overdoses and specifically related to the opioid epidemic that we're facing right now as a country. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you some of that here. But more than 64,000 Americans died from drug overdoses in 2016. And you can see that number is climbing. You see the jump it took or is expected to take. So this has gone up. I don't know why they think it's going to go up at a more almost exponential rate in 2017. Maybe they know something that I don't. I'm assuming they're smart people. Uh, here's a uh, chart that breaks it up a little bit. So you have differences. And again, a lot of this focuses on opioids. So you have methadone, which is pretty consistent here. If you look at synthetic opioids, other than methadone, that's skyrocketed. Heroin's gone up a ton in the last five years. Uh, and then natural, synthetic opioids, cocaine, eh, a little bit here and there. And everything's kind of trending up. I think that's where they're seeing this big increase is that if this trend keeps going, they're going to see, you know, the whole total amount's going to exponentially increase. But we'll see what happens there. All right. Uh, most common prescription medication poisonings, or you could just think of medication poisoning. It's not all these might be prescription, but... Um, analgesics, sedatives, antipsychotics, antidepressants, which makes sense if they're psychiatric patients. And uh, this is pretty similar across the board. If you look at international rates, too, that's the most common ones people are overdosing on. The exception is Israel. For some reason, people overdose on antibiotics, which is my fun fact of the day, I guess. It's really weird. I don't know why, how that would happen or why you do that, but okay. Um, clinical cues, clues, okay, so review of systems, that's going to cue you into what your patient might have taken. A lot of times your patient might not be able to say anything to you. There might be altered mental status, they don't have a good history. EMS comes in with a bag of drugs and puts it down and says, okay, I found all these bottles in the person's room. And they're like, well, half of them are empty, half of them are three years old. What did the person take? What did they have access to? It can be really difficult to understand. So that's where you guys come into play with your diagnostic skills, and we'll talk about some of those things you might see here. But these are sort of the, the general um, areas you'd look for. Questions I would ask as a pharmacist and a provider should ask, too, uh, what drugs are taken or exposed to. But you can gather this from a medical record. You can ask the patient. You can ask family. Again, you can look at what EMS might have brought in. EMS has sort of a standard practice that they will grab whatever they can and bring it into the hospital with them if it's a suspected medication overdose, just because they don't have time. They want to get the patient into the hospital. They don't have time to go through everything and try and figure it out. They'll just kind of grab it all and pull it in. Now, will they miss stuff? Is there other stuff somewhere else? Possibly. Who knows? Um, time of ingestion and exposure, uh, the maximum possible dose the patient could have taken, one-time ingestion or exposure over several hours or days, accidental or intentional, decontamination efforts, which we'll talk about, for the patient uh, have an emesis episode or multiple emesis episodes on the way or um, after ingestion and how soon after ingestion was that and how much does the patient weigh. That's a good thing because a lot of these treatments are weight based so getting an accurate weight is really important. That's more of a nursing workflow thing but just so you guys are aware. Current clinical picture again from the previous slide what other symptoms you might see. Okay. So talk to patient care, uh, looking at assessing and stabilizing the patient. We want to obtain access labs, vitals, decontamination efforts. If we can get rid of any active product before it gets into the bloodstream, that's what decontamination is, and I'll talk about those here in a second. And then are there any antidotes? And if so, we're going to administer them. If not, we're going to look at supportive care options. So that's really the treatment strategy here. A lot of times you just end up, there's not a lot of antidotes out there, so a lot of times you just end up with supportive care options for these patients. You kind of they're really sedated, let them sleep it off, try and let it wear off their wear out of their system if they're not doing anything like protect like they're protecting their airway and they aren't agitated or anything like that. Alright, I want to talk really briefly about screening tools because I get asked this question a lot. You're in drug screening. These are the things that show up on a standard butox screen. Benzodiazepines, I pointed this out, minus clam. One, our toxicologist at Abbott told me about this. I actually didn't ever had never heard about this, but she said clonazepam, lorazepam, alprazolam, and midazolam won't actually show up on a UCOX. And um, these three are probably the three most common benzodiazepines people would take it as an outpatient. So I think the only midazolam you would care about, but I think the only one that you might see on a UCOX that might be beneficial would probably be diazepam. The rest of them, I mean, unless they're on something obscure like temazepam or oxazepam, which people don't take that often anymore. But again, your clonopin, Ativan, and Xanax are all not going to show up. Uh, cocaine. Uh, other things on here too, a lot of uh, amphetamine type things and opioids. I'll show you a little, 
this link, if you follow it, um, it'll make you sign into Medscape. Medscape's free. It's kind of a useful tool. I think there's some good utility there. So if you want to sign up for it, go for it. But don't feel like I'm trying to force you to do something you don't want to. <laughs> They do email you, so if you don't like spam or anything like that. Okay, so anyway, MedTalks has this uh, article, and there's a table in it that I like to use. It's one of the best ones that I've seen out there, and it shows you false positive results. And this is a really nice feature to have if you're running a UTOX, and I get, get this question a lot. This patient's positive for all this stuff, but I don't think she's actually taking it. Why is that? Well, let's see. Let's look at something really common here, like um, uh, ibuprofen. So ibuprofen has a cross-reactivity false positive for this drug, which is methadone. Oh, so is the patient taking methadone or ibuprofen? I don't know. Does that make a difference? Yes, <laughs> of course it does. So just for reference, the, a lot of false positives on these tests, like um, let's look at where are tricyclics. Oh, they don't have tricyclics on here. But it can happen like opioids. Let's see what else has false positives with opioids. Not too much. It's one that might pull up a few lines. Cannabinoids, ibuprofen, naproxen. So and common analgesics are going to cross-react on a lot of them. So anyway, point is, is that you can't always be 100% sure of what you're looking at. There's a lot of controversy with UTOX. I went to a tox talk a while ago where uh, the guy was basically kind of bragging on them the whole time. I think they can show some utility if you're looking for adherence to certain things or maybe to see what somebody might take if you have no other option. But the guy I went to the talk on was also pointing out that there could be legal implications to getting a UTOX. Like, for example, I think the example he gave was a, a person comes in and they claim that they were given a drug at a party and they were raped or sexually assaulted. And you do a UTOX on them and they're test negative for benzodiazepines. Well, could that be used in court possibly to say, well, this person was negative for any drugs that would be likely used in a sexual assault case. So that could possibly work against the patient. That was his argument. I don't know how realistic that is or how often that comes up. But just something to consider that if you don't really have a good reason to get the UTOX, don't bother with it. And a lot of those drugs, just to backtrack a little bit for that type of, like the date rape drugs that we talked about a while ago. Actually, did we talk about those? No, those drugs of abuse. Okay, sorry. Um, they're really short acting, so they aren't going to last long enough for a UTOX to really pick them up anyway. Okay, anyway, that's the controversy. Again, use them, use the UTOX just judiciously. It can help, but sometimes it's just really noisy and doesn't really give you all that much. Uh, blood tests, uh, aspirin, acetaminophen are going to be key for any ingestion. Um, if you call poison control, they're going to always recommend that. So it's a good habit just to order them on every single overdose patient you get. The reason is they come back pretty quick. You don't know if somebody ingested a combination product, and those can be deadly overdoses if you don't catch them. So it's important just to at least rule them out to see if they're there or not even if you're pretty sure the patient didn't take it. But they come and say, oh, I was taking OxyContin all day. What if they're really taking Percocet and that's what they're calling it, right? They could have ingested a ton of Tylenol and you don't really know that. Um, so that's just, again, something to double check. It's really easy to do. Um, other tests, uh, most will be send outs and not helpful in acute situations. So a lot of things we can't necessarily do an assay for quickly. So it's not going to be um, well utilized in an emergency. Maybe over time you might be able to see that might give you some clinical picture later on what they actually took, but for the time being, we wouldn't know. Uh, and a lot of this is going to happen pretty quickly. Okay, GI decontamination methods. Vast majority of ingestions do not require any type of decontamination. The risks greatly outweigh the benefits. The reason is aspiration. So if you're going to decontaminate somebody's GI tract, you really have to make sure that they're with it and that they can um, protect their airway. Uh, and then probably going to pre-medicate with anti-emetics. So I'll talk about a couple things. First of all, some things that we don't really use all that much anymore. Gastric lavage actually is never used anymore. That's stomach pumping. No one gets their stomach pumped. Just the aspiration risk is really high with that, and there's no real benefit to get doing that. Um, emesis might happen on its own, right? The patient might throw up on their own, and that's okay. You wouldn't want to stop that. Not that you really could anyway. Uh, but for the most part, you wouldn't actually try and induce emesis in anybody. I've got a family guy video to show you guys here in a second, but I'll finish the slide first. Um, whole bowel irrigation, acute ingestions only, not routine. This would be only something where there's a lot of junk in the GI tract and you want to flush it out. The times this happens is if somebody's like a drug packer, so if they were trying to smuggle drugs across a border or through an airport or something and they ingested a whole bunch of like condoms full of heroin and a couple of them broke open, you could whole ball irrigate. And basically all it is is giving them a colonoscopy prep in a really short amount of time. So you're giving a product like Go Lightly, which is polyethylene glycol, like Miralax, 
and you just give it to them fast and they drink it. Usually they don't get too much of it before they start to feel sick, but I've only done it once in my career. It hasn't happened that often, and it wasn't a drug packer. It was somebody who took a ton of lithium, and lithium capsules kind of glom together if you take a lot of them, so the idea was we could flush it out of the system versus letting it absorb slowly. Um, it didn't work all that well. He didn't tolerate it until he started throwing up, so <laughs> that was that. Uh, whole ball irrigation not used all that much. Oh, let me show you. All right. You guys might have seen this at some point if you're Family Guy fans. Syrup of Ipecac, by the way, anybody have heard of this? Okay, and can, can induce vomiting. I think they used to use it for toxicology to induce emesis. No longer recommended. All on my tab. Now, whoever goes the longest without puking gets the last piece of pie in the fridge. Okay, here we go. How's everybody doing? Good, good so far. All right, all right. Nothing yet. Cool, cool. You know, I, I don't know if you guys had any of that pie already, but that is, uh, that is some tasty stuff. That's from the uh, bake sale. Yeah! <laughs> oh, what the? There's somebody who would be having it. <laughs> I'm sorry, you feel funny. Well, I feel fine. I guess I'm gonna. <laughs> oh boy, that means I win. I get eaten. <laughs> oh God! Why didn't anybody tell you? <laughs> oh my God! My insides are on fire. <laughs> not recommended medically anymore. The one thing that we still sometimes do to decontaminate people is use activated charcoal. So activated charcoal has a couple uses and really timing's the big thing here. You have to do it about one to two hours post ingestion. There are some caveats to that that I'll talk about here in a minute and charcoal is a little bit controversial. It really depends on what you've ingested and how dangerous it is. So the things poison control will probably go through if you're thinking about charcoal is, is there an easy antidote? So for example, even if an acetaminophen ingestion happened a couple hours ago, probably aren't going to give charcoal just because we can reverse acetaminophen toxicity really easily if we catch it early. Um, and the risk, again, if you aspirate not only the stomach contents, but a bunch of activated charcoal, it can get really nasty. It can actually cause a pretty bad pneumonitis type situation. And in that case, they just they won't recommend that. But if it's something that we don't really have a good use, like I'll give you an example. Try uh, tricyclic antidepressants um, are pretty much fatal in overdose. There's not really a lot you can do. We'll talk about them in a second here. But if that was the case, that would be definitely a charcoal uh, or beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. Those are the big ones that pretty common medications that people can easily die from if they aren't treated. And there's not really a good treatment for them or an antidote for them. So if we can get a decontamination on board, we're going to try. Um, other things like if somebody took a whole, you know, I don't know, Skittles bag worth of psych meds, you know, different stuff. What do they call them at farm parties? Is that what the kids call them? I don't know. I don't know if that's actually true. Um, some, one of my managers used the term like a Skittles party, and I'd never heard that before, so that's why I said that. But anyway, <laughs> he's like, what are you talking about? Basically, you combine a whole bunch of psych meds in one jar and take them. No, anyway, somebody would just take, like, maybe they have access to five or six different antipsychotics, and they take a whole bunch of them at once. Usually, you aren't going to decontaminate that person. They're probably going to be fine. There's not a whole lot of risk for that. Again, so it depends on risk and time. Those are the two big things, and whether or not we have an easily available antidote in case toxicity does occur. Dosing isn't an exact science. If you look it up, they recommend about one gram per kilogram of activated charcoal. Activated charcoal comes usually in a big tube like this. It kind of looks like this when you pour it into a glass. This is powder that somebody mixed with water. I bet it looks pretty similar. It's this big slurry of black liquid. I've never actually tried it. I imagine it tastes kind of like burned wood, but I have no idea. Um, they used to flavor it with sorbitol uh, to make it sweet and also to 
get people to um, as a cathartic too, so it move it through. So the idea was you give the charcoal, you bind up whatever's in the stomach, and then it moves on its way through, and the sorbitol helps it. That actually was shown to cause severe diarrhea, increased risk of nausea and vomiting, and actually people aspirated a lot more frequently on it. So the only people that ever ask me about that are some of the older nurses will say, oh, should, should we use with or without sorbitol? They don't make it with sorbitol anymore. So we don't use sorbitol. It's just standard activated charcoal. Uh, what else is there interesting about charcoal? We talked about timing a little bit. A bezoar, what that is, if you guys haven't talked about that, it's basically a big clump of stuff that sticks together. So if you take, especially capsules, they have a gelatin coating. If you take a whole bunch of them at once, they, they do have a high propensity to just clump together. Some tablets do that too. Uh, Multi-dose activated charcoal is rare, and it's something you probably only see in really odd overdoses. I put the drugs up there specifically. Uh, the reason is these drugs undergo enterohepatic recycling. So that means after they're absorbed, the liver shoots them back out into the GI tract and they get reabsorbed. So the idea is that you're continuously giving activated charcoal to keep getting that stuff that's getting sent back out basically unchanged and then so it doesn't get reabsorbed again. Uh, otherwise, these drugs can kind of go on forever. You can get one dose of activated charcoal, and if some of it already absorbed, it's going to keep recycling. And that's really rare. I think I've seen one person on that in our ICU once in the last few years. Now, in fact, I don't pay attention to this, so it could happen more often than that, but again, it's quite rare. Um, and then antiemetic. So I always recommend an antiemetic if you're going to give somebody, I don't know if poison control really does this, but I think it's just common sense. If you're going to give somebody activated charcoal, the example I'll give you is a lady who came in who took uh, like 50 metoprolol tablets, and she was with it still. Uh, it was about an hour ago, not even, I think it was like 30 minutes ago, so we'd set to do charcoal on her, and um, I gave her some Zil I Well, I recommended giving some Zilfran beforehand. I think it's just a smart move to prevent any possible emesis. You, you never know how sick she's going to feel after she drinks a whole bunch of black slurry junk, and uh, anybody probably would have a difficult time keeping that down on a normal day, much less if you're feeling anxious because you just overdosed and maybe attempted suicide or if it was accidental and you're anxious for that. So anyway, the point is, is antiemetics can be really helpful if you're giving charcoal and it might just be a good thing. The only thing, time I wouldn't give it is if the person's QTC is already prolonged or something like that. So Frank could contribute to that, but one dose probably not going to be a big deal. Okay. Any questions about charcoal before I move on? Yeah. Oh yeah, thank you. So um, the delayed gastric absorption be anything that might be slowing down GI motility. I'll give you an example of a patient we had who presented, claimed they overdosed on Tylenol alone, um, and so we ran a Tylenol level, didn't really get anything back. They admitted them to the ICU just in case to follow labs, and their Tylenol level spiked about 24 hours after admission. Well, they took a bunch of Tylenol PM. And the Benadryl actually, because the anticholinergic slowed down the GI tract, so the absorption was significantly delayed. That would be a case where if somebody came in and you knew they took Tylenol PM or something anticholinergic, um, they might say, well, the GI tract might be kind of paralyzed at this point, so you could technically try and bind it up with the charcoal, even if it's several hours out. Again, it just depends on if the patient's with it. Um, in that case, it's hard to imagine a patient who's not going to be pretty sedated after taking a ton of Benadryl, but it's possible. So uh, it, it's something that I would definitely recommend calling poison control on and getting their opinion. But they might don't be surprised if you actually have a ingestion over two hours out and if there is some delayed gastric absorption. If the patient's protecting their airway, they might consider it. Um, tricyclic antidepressants would be another great example. Very anticholinergic medications, very toxic. So the idea is that if you can prevent that, any of that from absorbing, it might be worth doing in that case. So. Um, some caveats there, but generally speaking, you're going to follow this time rule pretty carefully with uh, with activated charcoal. And the bezoar, what is that? That's the clumping up of something. So the idea is that it just takes a long time for it to fully absorb because it's just this big chunk. Uh, and so you could give repeat doses or delay your dose and still maybe have some efficacy because it's going to take a longer time. Its transit time will be longer overall than just a few tablets. Okay, um, some things charcoal won't bind to. So charcoal, I didn't really say this, but charcoal is just carbon surface area. So anything that's a hydrocarbon-like molecule, which are most of our small molecule drugs, are mostly organic molecules, are going to have a um, are going to be able to absorb or absorb just fine to the charcoal surface area. What won't absorb or anything that has, if you think about like ionized things, heavy metals, inorganic ions. Um, some of the big ones I think of on here. 
lithium, uh, iron, the rest of this stuff, alcohol. Uh, so if somebody drinks a bunch of ethylene, ethylene glycol or methanol, which is not totally uncommon, windshield washer fluid or antifreeze, those uh, won't be absorbed by charcoal either. So just a couple things that won't be. The biggest one I would recommend knowing is lithium. That's going to be probably the, the most significant overdose you'll see from the psychiatric community. Uh, I've seen a couple windshield washer fluid ingestions, but they're pretty rare, um, or at least they don't come to our hospital, I guess. Okay, let's talk through a couple different types of poisoning. Cholinergic poisoning is going to be very unusual to actually see in practice. Um, usually not related to medications. So there's some eye drops that you could ingest a lot of. Somebody drank an entire bottle of eye drop, but that I don't think that ever happens. Uh, maybe, but weirder things have probably happened, but I've never seen that. Causes are going to be the big ones. You probably will see if you work rural, you'll see farm um, industrial type pesticide exposures. That's going to be probably the most common. One, um, in the cities, we don't see this a whole lot. Otherwise, mushrooms. Some mushrooms contain muscarin. Uh, people are just going to get diarrhea and pretty bad GI side effects for the most part. It's usually not deadly unless you're talking about a large industrial scale exposure, which is possible, but unusual. Um, atropine can be used. Uh, you might get some effect from it, just reversing um, the receptor activity. Uh, Praladoxine is something that can help regenerate acetylcholinesterase. So the thing is, you're getting all this, your, your acetylcholinesterase is getting used up trying to break down whatever cholinergic product you've ingested. And so it wears itself out, runs out, then praladoxine can help regenerate that. Um, we are, I think every hospital is actually supposed to have some of this on board. I remember I was doing inventory in our hospital in like 2011, and I found this jar that was dated from the 1980s that had this powder of praladoxine in it, and it was hard as a rock. I'm not sure how you'd actually make any usable product out of that. So uh, the point is, is that I don't know how many places actually keep a stock of this, but I don't think we do. It might be one of those things that's recommended for certain areas of the country or if you're a rural hospital and have um, possible farming accident exposure type stuff. But that's about it. Nothing really too common with cholinergic toxicity. Anticholinergic poisoning, much more common, and especially in subtle amounts. So you can get anticholinergic toxicity pretty easily, even from therapeutic doses of medications. The toxidrome is really well known. So it's these little rhymes, or not rhymes, but alliteration things. Uh, blind as a bat, hot as a hair, mad as a hatter, dry as a bone, red as a bee, bloated as a bladder, tacky as a polyester suit. I think they're easy. I kind of hate <laughs> mnemonics in general. So I don't know if you guys had a tox lecture yet. Anyone? You did? Okay. Did they talk about a lot of mnemonics? I feel like tox people love mnemonics. I hate them. I never remember them. These are the only ones I like because I feel like they're easier to remember. It's not really a mnemonic either. It's just these little things that somewhat are easy to remember. It's easy to remember from an anticholinergic side effect profile too as you're thinking about just patient exposure. So this is the kind of stuff you'll see with anticholinergic toxicity. Uh, the most problematic ones are probably going to be the tachycardia. Um, as far as what's going to acutely bring somebody into the emergency department and what they don't really have. Oh, and the mad as a hatter, too. So the, uh, the CNS-related disturbances are going to be um, things that might show up on your radar if you work emergency medicine. So some causes. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants, antihistamine, specifically Benadryl. Um, people who use scopolamine patches excessively. Believe it or not, I had an old lady once who came in, and she had like three scopolamine patches on her behind her ear, she just never took them off, and sure enough, those do keep distributing doses, even in small amounts, after their dose window is done, and so she was pretty toxic on uh, scopolamine. Uh, oxybutynin, tolteridine for muscles, or for uh, bladder spasm, muscle relaxants, antipsychotics, there's a lot of other drugs out there. We've talked about a number of them throughout the course. These are kind of the big ones I see people overdose on. Usually it's not a huge problem, and anticholinergic toxicity generally doesn't kill somebody on its own. It's dangerous, it can be problematic, uh, but for the most part, uh, people can recover from it. It's not something that there's anything acutely happening. The tachycardia can cause some arrhythmias, potentially, but it's rare to see that be the sole cause. Um, so you could give activated charcoal. Basically, the only time you'd ever do that is with a tricyclic antidepressant overdose. The rest of these are probably not going to be useful or needed, I should say. If the person's really agitated, so if this is the person that's running around because they're really hot and delirious and they're running around naked in the street and somebody calls the cops on them, benzodiazepines will be a, a good source of uh, calm for them. Uh, and also prevent seizures, which is really rare but possible. Um, ice packs, if they're hyperthermic. 
And there is a drug called physostigmine, which is an IV acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. It's for severe cases or diagnostics, not for um, a TCA overdose. So the, the reason why you wouldn't do that is because if you reverse the anticholinergic, you aren't really doing anything. TCAs have a, have a um, arrhythmic mechanism that causes them to be deadly. Uh, so it's much more cardiac focused, even though they do have an anticholinergic component. So the point with physostigmine is it's not going to help you in a TCA overdose because it's just going to reverse those one, that subset of symptoms, not going to help with the main symptoms. Um, I think I mentioned this as a diagnostic tool, but it does work for figuring out if somebody took something anticholinergic, so you can give somebody a little bit of physostigmine, and if they are delirious and all of a sudden they snap out of it, that could be a source that you know that they took something anticholinergic. Yes. What is the AC indicating? Where? Oh, activated charcoal. Yes. Uh, and just think about any PM product. A lot of them contain diphenhydramine, so people might overdose on it accidentally, not even realizing what they're taking. So not not uncommon at all. Okay, uh, acetaminophen. Acetaminophen is by far the most common drug associated with poisonings, both accidentally and intentionally. Most widely used analgesic worldwide. People have lots of access to it. It's widely believed to be very safe, which it is, but if you take a ton of it, it's not. Uh, it comes in many products, lots of brand names and generic equivalents and combinations out there, so that's where it gets dangerous. You're taking regular acetaminophen and start taking combination product on top of it, and then you end up getting toxic and you didn't even realize it. Max therapeutic dose, 4 grams per day. Uh, we consider about 150 mg per kick or 7.5 grams as potentially toxic. And people will present sort of like this in the first 0 to 24 hours. The presentation for acetaminophen toxicity is really variable. There's not any specific set of symptoms, which makes it easy to miss. That's another reason why it's recommended to get an APAP or acetaminophen level on every single person that walks in with an overdose because you never really know. And it's very nondescript. A lot of the times, the acetaminophen toxicities or um, overdoses I've seen, people have just been maybe a little bit slightly nauseous, um, stomach irritability, stuff like that, but nothing overt, and that makes it really dangerous. It can kind of insidious in the first day or so. Uh, stage two, 24 to 48 hours later, LFT INRs <laughs> will start to rise substantially, and you're going to have people get right upper quadrant pain. Stage three, 48 to 96 hours, peak of abnormal LFTs, INR, fulminant liver failure if possible, uh, jaundice, confusion, and coma. And stage four would be um, up to two weeks later, and most patients will actually make a full recovery. So even if you didn't treat somebody, um, the liver is pretty resilient if you can tolerate a little bit of hepatotoxicity. A lot of hepatotoxicity is problematic, and of course, if they went to fulminant liver failure, that's going to require some kind of a transplant or that person will die. So uh, it's really rare to see an acetaminophen case actually progress to that, and we have really good treatments to prevent that, but it is possible. Uh, this is a patient that I followed in 2013. I just wanted to show you how labs can trend over time. So I'll show you, this is a three-day lab that I just pulled in here of you, and you can see they started when they first took their labs. You can see their ALT, AST at 2,300, uh, INR elevated. This wasn't a patient on warfarin or anything. So INR is a really great marker of actual hepatic function. So your liver produces clotting factors or synthesizes clotting factors from vitamin K. And if it's not doing that correctly, it means that there's something wrong. Um, and that could either be they're taking warfarin or their liver's failing. And so you'll see this in alcoholic cirrhosis patients or advanced hepatitis patients where their INR will just be transiently high. Um, and that's because they aren't producing clotting factors because their liver is failing. So that's a clear sign of actual liver function. Whereas liver function tests, it just enzymes and that's leakage from the cells when they get damaged. So it's two different pools. They're both important for diagnostic criteria and both nice, they should trend together mostly. And you can see in this patient it did. Uh, but it's just, I think, interesting to watch. So when we don't really get too excited with ALT, AST, I don't know how much you guys have talked about this until it's really high. That's pretty high. Uh, that's impressive. Um, so that's a definite. Usually you're looking at like 10 times the upper limit of normal when you start to get really excited about it. And that's uh, that's pretty pretty significant there. All right. Um, so I have a little skull system I use to describe what I consider deadly. And one skull means can be deadly. Two skulls is very deadly. Okay? And no skulls is people don't usually die from this. Uh, okay. Acetaminophen is, uh, again, kind of... On the deadly side, it's definitely something we treat as a medical emergency and we treat aggressively uh, because it's common. So if we 
didn't do anything, even though the risks of actually getting liver failure are rare, it's still something uh, we want to prevent if we can, of course. Uh, so treatment, um, activated charcoal may be, again, usually not recommended in these patients unless there is some weird situation going on where there's maybe a co-ingested substance. Uh, you probably wouldn't do that. Um, again, nonspecific symptoms. And then the big treatment here is IV and acetylcysteine, or people call it NAC for short. Uh, Acetidote is the brand name of this product. And you give it weight-based, uh, a loading dose over an hour, another kind of middle loading dose over four hours, and then an infusion over 16 hours. You can repeat this if you want to. If the patients still have elevated enzymes, you can do like a continuation of this 100 mg per kilo infusion. Uh, you can have people on it for a couple of days, potentially. But usually that's enough to, to get them where they need to go. I'll talk about the mechanism in a second. Um, just to point out, there isn't uh, there is an oral an acetylcysteine product available that there are some oral protocols for. We don't use it anymore. People tend to vomit because it smells like sulfur, and people will uh, not tolerate it all that long. And it takes a long time. It's a really long protocol, whereas the uh, IV protocol is only over a day. I think the oral one lasts over like three days is what the full protocol is. Oral gets you, or IV gets you a lot more faster and where it needs to go. Okay, so how does it work? Acetylcysteine is hepatoprotective. It restores hepatic glutathione. So if we look at how acetaminophen gets metabolized, we know the structure is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So acetaminophen moves and gets metabolized into this NAPQ, NAPQQI metabolite. Glutathione then um, uh, modifies, the medica modifies the molecule into something that's easily excretable by the kidneys. Now, if you use up all your glutathione, you get a second pathway where, um, it gets converted by a different set of cytochrome P450 enzymes into this, mediate, this intermediate product that can't be metabolized further, and that's actually hepatotoxic. So it's a case of the body just not knowing really what to do with this product once you ingest so much of it, you use up its natural pathway of moving through the liver, which is safe, and then you go into a pathway that produces toxicity. You do that enough, you cause a lot of hepatotoxicity, and if you have a lot in your system, this can actually run off pretty quickly. So you imagine if somebody took like a whole bottle of Tylenol and then all of it absorbed, you know, a 100 pound bottle of 500 milligrams of Tylenol, that's a lot more than four grams. So how can you liver process that much? Eventually it can't. So the idea is we can get uh, this glutathione substitute and allow it to help with the metabolism of acetaminophen and also in that process it should help your body to restore its natural glutathione production process as well. This is the RUMAC Matthew nomogram. It's a really common tool to discuss and diagnose what you should do in a or, uh, treatment decision tool, I should say. So how do you decide if you're going to give somebody acetylcysteine? So you do a plasma level of acetaminophen, and basically if they're above this treatment line, here's your hours post-ingestion. The four-hour level is pretty common. Before four hours, it's really not that beneficial. Your body's still distributing it. You could still be absorbing some. I get this question from a lot of physicians, and it kind of bothers me. They're, some people are really gung-ho about this. Somebody comes in two hours post-ingestion, they're like, I need to get a level right now. Why? What are you going to do at that level? It could be really high. It could be low. You don't really know what's going to happen. Four hours is what all the literature says. So some people will be like, or, or what, what people will say is, well, I'm sure that they took it. I believe this person. Let's get a level and start N-acetylcysteine right now without even knowing. You can wait a little bit to figure it out. You don't have to start it right now. Um, it does take some time for the for the liver to deplete glutathione. You do have a window of opportunity here. So four hours is really the recommendation. And that's where all the studies are. So, you know, again, I'm not going to judge my physician colleagues. Sometimes they can be really aggressive with some of this stuff. But um, personally, I don't think there's literature to support doing uh, N-acetylcysteine dosing prior to a level unless you have some good reasons for it. I'll give you some of those in a second. So anyway, uh, four hours post-ingestion, you do a level, it comes back over this threshold. So there's this treatment line, and then there's this dotted line. Uh, so there's some variable variability on where you should actually treat. Um, the RUMAC Matthew, I think they published a paper saying you should actually wait until it's above their line to treat. And right in here, you probably don't have high risk. But a lot of times people will treat in there. It's sort of like a clinical decision. If you think the person's at risk or took a lot or whatever, um, usually if it's above that basic treatment line, we still do treat it. Um, I have had people right below the treatment line, and Poison Center has recommended not treating. So they do take that cutoff pretty seriously. So if you're like, do they kind of round up or not? No, they, it's like, that's it or not. 
All right, so some more indications of N-acetylcysteine. So again, four hours or more following acute ingestion of immediate release product, and then above that treatment line is where you generally treat. Um, other times you'd use it, suspected single ingestion greater than 150 mg per kilo in a patient for whom the serum acetaminophen concentration will not be available until more than eight hours from time of ingestion. So this could be somebody who um, had a witness ingestion and they might not have came into the hospital for a while. It could be a place that can't get an acetaminophen lab very quickly, like a rural hospital, although I think they should be able to do that, but you never know. Um, third, patient with an unknown time of ingestion and a serum acetaminophen concentration greater than 10 mics per milliliter. It could be somebody who comes in, oh, I took a ton of Tylenol yesterday, and you check their level, it's still high, start treating them. Patient with a history of acetaminophen ingestion and evidence of any liver injury. So they come in, you do a panel on them. Do you think they took it at some point? You've got an APAP lab pending and you get uh, really spiked AST, ALT, then you're going to want to treat them. Patients with delayed presentation, so 24 hours after ingestion, consisting of laboratory evidence of liver failure and history of excessive acetaminophen ingestion, similar to the one above it. So, yeah. Um, is liver injury going to stop the Probably not. So an acute ingestion, that's why that lab is important at the four hour mark, because you probably aren't going to see elevated enzymes. If you if you took a ton on an empty stomach, you might start to see some stuff start to trend up, but I don't think you're going to see that high of a peak right away. Yes? I think that poison control is right under the line, that's not Correct. No, that's the thing. It's pretty benign. Really, the only side effect to it is uh, it has a relatively high risk of anaphylaxis compared to other drugs. It's not super high, but compared to your average drug, people tend to have hypersensitivity reactions more commonly than they would other things. But that's really the only risk with it. Yes? Can you get the INR always with I'd recommend doing it, yeah. You can get an INR back really quick on patients, too. Um, so, like, that's part of our iStat lab, so we can get that back in a few minutes. Yes? Did you say what to do if they need Matthew Lyman? Lyman treat, but what do you do That's, it's, okay. So some people might recommend only treating if it's above Rumac Matthew. Some people might say in between is sort of a no man's land. It's, it's questionable whether there's evidence for hepatotoxicity in this intermediate space. Yeah. Um, most of the evidence supports above the Rumac Matthew line, but I think this is to catch those people. So you can think about it this way, that the Rumac Matthew I don't know, the people published information on this line being the, the cutoff for liver damage. And so maybe they dropped it a little bit to say, well, let's catch those people who are slightly below. That's why if you go below the actual treatment line, they don't recommend doing it. I'm not. We're talking about right? Poss possible, possible liver damage, yeah, possible liver damage. You don't know for sure at this point usually, unless you're pretty far out. But yeah, and you never know. I mean, a liver can fully recover from a pretty bad acetaminophen overdose with no help whatsoever. but. Yep. All right. Any other questions about Tylenol or n acetylcysteine? All right. Let's talk about aspirin, and then we'll take a quick break. All right. Aspirin, aspirin, or Pepto Bismol, wintergreen oil, Bengay, Alka Seltzer. They all contain salicylates, and they can all cause salicylate toxicity. Uh, usually, they. So I put a mnemonic on here, even though I know I hate them, but. Um, uh, <laughs> Spells out aspirin, kind of. So uh, altered mental status, seizures, and coma are kind of the big things I would think about as being the, the major problems here. Um, vitals, uh, not too bad. The, the respiratory rate, heart rate, temperature are going to increase a little bit, but not going to be the major cause of problems here. It's going to be the neurologic complications that are really uh, going to cause injury to somebody. But sweating, pulmonary edema, ringing in the ears, those are kind of hallmark things that might happen with the salicylate ingestion, so this could lead you clinically down the diagnostic trail of that treatment. Um, activated charcoal is usually indicated if it's going to be within that time frame, uh, just because salicylate toxicity can be problematic if you let it accumulate. The other things you can do are really just two things. You can give somebody IV sodium bicarbonate. Um, usually you give a bolus of this and then a continuous infusion. This alkalinizes the urine and blood and changes your concentration gradient, causing you to basically um, excrete salicylic acid. So you're going to get it out of the CNS, decrease the concentration, and hopefully excrete it through the uh, kidneys faster. Um, it alkalizes the urine pH a little bit. The other thing you can do is dialyze it off. So if it's a really significant overdose, you can get them to urgent dialysis and remove uh, 
whatever the toxic thing, usually it's aspirin, uh, but whatever salicylate it is should dialyze off pretty regularly. Those are the two major things. Not a whole lot else to talk about. I don't see this all that much. And again, this is another level you can check really easily, just like uh, Tylenol. All right, we'll take a five minute break and come back and talk about TCAs. <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, bear with me, we'll get through the rest of the stuff pretty quickly here. <laughs> okay, so tricyclic antidepressants. This is a, a really nasty thing to overdose on, and if you want to be morbid, you can think of like, what's the best way to kill yourself uh, by medication? Take a whole bunch of tricyclic antidepressants, because there's not a whole lot you can do. It's one of the few things that you can overdose on that's very cardiotoxic, and there's not a good reversal at all. Uh, so in this case, I just put some examples up there in case you forgot what drugs we're talking about here. Uh, but you have a couple of things going on. Usually anticholinergic toxidrome is in play, um, which can cause some seizures, but that can also come from the actual um, uh, CNS effects of the drug itself. Cardiovascular toxicity is the big one. So when we talk about the really deadly stuff out there, we're mostly talking about stuff that directly is cardiotoxic. Those are really hard to, it's hard to reverse something that's causing an arrhythmic effect on the heart or blocking heart receptors. Uh, just very difficult to do that. So um, it's proarrhythmic, and if you remember a little bit of what we talked about with last semester, or sorry, um, fall semester, and then a little bit about the TCAs, they have uh, inhib inhibition of fast sodium channels, so they're kind of like class A, um, or type, type 1, sorry, class A antiarrhythmics. And they can prolong QRS, prolong QTC interval, AV branch bundle blocks, or bundle branch blocks, excuse me, uh, ventricular dysrhythmias, PEA, asystole would be the ultimate um, cause of, of death in a patient like this. Uh, delayed onset can be, can be common with this just because of the anticholinergic aspect of the toxicity, delaying gastric absorption and gastric transit time. Treatments, um, definitely activated charcoal if you're within that window. And even if you're a little bit delayed, if the patient's still conscious and you think they took it or have pretty good evidence that they took a bunch of TCAs, that's probably something you want to give them. Um, it's just once it gets in their system, there's not a whole lot you can do. So if we can keep it out of it, that's the best, best medicine there. Um, sodium bicarbonate can be used if the QRS is greater than 100 milliseconds. If QRS narrows, you could consider a bicarbonate drip. I should probably say less than 100. I think it's a narrow QRS complex you'd give it. Um, benzos for seizures, agitation, so supportive care really. Uh, Phosphenitoin, so we talked about that as an option for a status epilepticus. That also has proarrhythmic properties, usually not at seizure doses, but if somebody already took a bunch of TCAs, we want to make sure that they aren't getting more proarrhythmic drugs. Uh, and then really the only thing you could maybe consider that would actually help the patient is lipid rescue. And I'll talk about that in a second. Basically what you do is you give a whole bunch of IV fat emulsion and it binds up whatever's in the bloodstream if it's fat soluble. TCAs aren't soup, they're kind of fat soluble, but they aren't like insanely lipophilic, so it's not a great option. Yes? Can you repeat what you said about the narrow QRS? Yeah, I think you just, I think it's just if the QRS is narrow, you give the bicarbonate. Or maybe, I don't know. I get my EKG stuff mixed up. I'm not sure. Maybe if it's wide, you do the push, and then you just do a drip otherwise. Uh, anyway, you can just think about EKG changes, bicarbonate. It's kind of a good rule of thumb for toxicology in general. It doesn't really matter. So if I, what I said doesn't make any sense, just ignore it. I'm not going to test you on QRS complexes in the exam. OK. Um, most other psych medications outside of TCAs have really wide therapeutic indexes. So SSRIs, SNRIs, atypicals, they're all going to be relatively well tolerated. You can take, there's a lot of case reports out there where people have taken tons of like citalopram and have not had any real um, adverse effects of them, maybe some sedation, maybe some QTC prolongation in some cases. Um, Notable exceptions, lithium. Uh, lithium has uh, the propensity to cause seizures and death. It's very easily... Uh, removed via dialysis. So I don't think of it as like a super deadly one, uh, but it can certainly be problematic and doesn't have a narrow therapeutic window. So people can get toxic on it pretty easily. Um, you can't, remember, you can't use activated charcoal for lithium. It's a big one. And the other psych medication I'd maybe keep in the back of your mind is bupropion, which can precipitate seizures if overdosed on. Or especially if the person has a propensity for seizures to begin with, if epilepsy or something like that, it can lower the seizure threshold. All right, opioids. Of course, tons of people have overdosed on opioids. The, one of the biggest uh, prob problems out there right now as far as toxicology goes. But 
Uh, it is really easy to reverse an opioid overdose. That's why I only gave it one skull. If you guys are debating my skull method here, uh, just bear with me. Uh, so symptoms, we talked about opioids at the beginning of the spring semester, but there's nothing really different here other than you're going to see, see severe respiratory depression and sedation, which is going to ultimately possibly lead to a death of some kind. Now, the other things you could happen are um, emesis and passing out and aspiration or choking. That can happen as well. Um, QTC prolongation with methadone. So methadone is the most dangerous one of these to overdose on because, again, it affects the heart in an adverse way. The rest of the opioids don't really do that. So that's one, if you know somebody took a bunch of methadone, that can cause a pretty nasty cardiac arrest situation. In addition to the opioid like toxidrome, you have a, a QRS or a QTC prolongation that can lead to a full-on um, pulseless arrhythmia of some kind. Uh, treatments, activated charcoal if indicated. Usually, if somebody ingested a bunch of opioids, we don't give them activated charcoal because we can reverse it with naloxone as needed, and so it's going to be safer to do that than to risk somebody aspirating with activated charcoal. If somebody drank a bunch of methadone or took a bunch of methadone tablets, I might consider that an option more so than if somebody took like a bunch of oxycodone. Uh, naloxone. So naloxone or Narcan is going to be our big one here. We can give 0.4 to 2 milligrams IV every two to three minutes. How much you give is really going to depend on the presentation of the patient. If the patient's kind of like in and out of it, really you can you know, wake them up if you smack them a little bit. Uh, you might want to stick on the lower end of that dose. If they're like almost blue when they come in, you might want to give them a, a big dose of Narcan to see. A lot of times EMS has tried Narcan there. It's stupid. They know how to address opioid uh, overdoses, so that's going to be something that they can give and do give fairly frequently in the community. In fact, police might give it. A lot of um, people are having access to this. Family members might have kits at home that they've given it. So a lot of times we know if the patient's responding to Narcan prior to the emergency department, but just, you know, you might have somebody who walks in or drops their friend off who's passed out and they shot up heroin and now they're, you know, in an overdose situation. Uh, you can do a uh, naloxone continuous infusion. One of the things to remember about naloxone, I don't have the half-life on here, but the half-life is only about an hour to two hours. Most opioids last longer than that, including heroin. Remember, heroin gets metabolized very fast. We haven't talked about drugs and abuse. We're doing that next week. Heroin gets very uh, fastly metabolized into morphine, and morphine has like a three, four-hour half-life. So basically, your naloxone is going to wear off and your drug is going to be in the system for about a couple hours longer. So if you have somebody who ingested and they're responding well to naloxone, um, you could maybe wait and see if they go back into it after you know, an hour or two. But um, I've started a lot of IV Narcan drips on people, and that's definitely appropriate in some cases. So don't feel bad about ordering that at all. It's definitely used. If somebody does have a QRS prolongation or some issues with cardiac toxicity, you could give them a bicarb drip as well. That can help with that. But uh, at that point, you might be looking at running a code on the person if they took a bunch of methadone. So just be prepared for that type of a situation if they're a methadone or if they bought methadone on the street. It does happen every once in a while. It's rare, but I'm surprised at what people would try and overdose on. Okay, um, sympathomimetic poisoning. So examples of these would be any type of stimulant. So cocaine, prescription stimulants, methamphetamine, ecstasy. Um, again, I'm going to try and fit this in next week, but these all basically increase uh, pressor type neurotransmitters. So norepinephrine, uh, sometimes serotonin, but norepinephrine is going to be the big one that's going to cause uh, increases and in changes in hemodynamics. Most of the time, these are benign. People overdose on these all the time and rarely have significant uh, fatalities from them. The, the problems depend on the agent, so I'll, I'll leave that a little bit for drug abuse. But cocaine, um, probably the biggest one that can cause some uh, issues with uh, cardiotoxicity. So that's the one that you might see arrhythmias on. Uh, but other than that, the rest of these, you know, methamphetamine, you might see some psychosis type symptoms, but uh, the other ones, once they're out of the system, the side effects should subside for the most part. Usually we don't give activated charcoal with this. If indicated, would be a really rare situation, but uh, I can't really picture in my head time when this would be indicated. Maybe in a child, if they consumed it, ingested a whole bunch of it, especially caffeine, like if they got a hold of caffeine powder or something like that, uh, that could be really dangerous. That could be a situation I could see charcoal being used in, but for the most part, I'm not going to be used for the average like amphetamine overdose. Uh, treatments, uh, other things, agitated patients, benzodiazepines are going to be great for that. They can help uh, calm down the patient. They can help with hypertension, uh, help with seizures as well. Sodium bicarbonate for wide complex tachycardia. Cool the patient if necessary. 
So sometimes you might have the patient really hyperthermic. Um, MDMA or ecstasy is notorious for causing that. If they're really, really hot, like 104, 105 degrees, you can consider putting some ice packs in their axillary areas and groins. Um, and then we talked about antihypertensive next week. Remember, don't leave your alpha receptors unopposed. Uh, phentolamine first, beta blocker second, or at the same time, uh, you want to make sure all your receptors are covered. You don't want to shunt whatever um, sympathomimetic drug is in their system to the other receptors. Um, again, we talked about lobetal all alone. It does have some alpha activity, but probably not enough to warrant sole use in most cases. Uh, Cocaine-induced angina, nitroglycerin has been shown to respond well to this, keeps those arteries open. The arteries kind of have a spasming effect on cocaine if you do a lot of it, and the nitro can keep those patent. And um, in severe cases, you could use nitroprusside as well. It's going to be like, essentially think of it as nitroglycerin on steroids for this case. Um, sedative hypnotics. This is really common, people ingesting benzos or too much Ambien. In fact, I've seen people come in with uh, accidentally taking an Ambien during the day, and they come in, they're just like really out of it and kind of weird. It's like, what did they take? And just, they just took a regular dose of Ambien. Uh, most of the time, it's nothing to do anything with. You can't really kill yourself taking benzodiazepines. Um, you, some people argue that it does cause CNS depression, and enough of that can potentially lead to respiratory depression. But there's a lot of case reports that will show you that um, unless there's a co-ingestant involved, it's very rare to see an actual overdose fatality from a benzodiazepine or any type of sleeper sedative type drug alone. Now, if you're like, um, I'll give an example of Heath Ledger, who combined benzos with, I think, a number of opioids and maybe alcohol too, I can't remember for sure. Uh, certainly that's a recipe for respiratory depression. Uh, but on their own, um, rare is it to cause, it might suppress your respiratory rate a little bit, but it's not going to cause to the point where you have to like intubate somebody. I've seen plenty of benzo overdoses and I've rarely ever had to intubate a person on them. Um, that's about it. All right, beta blockers. Uh, next two slides, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Very similar, very similar <laughs> treatment, very similar presentation, some very subtle differences, uh, but uh, essentially they're both Again, I put these in the tier of tricyclics where they're the most toxic and uh, highly difficult to do anything about if somebody comes in with a full-blown uh, you know, cardiac arrest from a beta blocker overdose. There's, there's not a whole lot you can do. Uh, metoprolol, tenolol, any beta blocker qualifies. It doesn't matter if it's selective or not. Um, symptoms, hypotension and bradycardia, so what you'd expect from taking too much beta blocker. And then you get into the more proarrhythmic type effects, so the, the prolonged PR interval, QRS prolongation, which can lead to an arrhythmia. Um, usually with beta blocker poisonings, you see maybe a transiently elevated potassium, and they're hypo or euglycemic. They usually aren't um, hyperglycemic. That's more a calcium channel blocker overdose. It doesn't really matter from a treatment standpoint. Treat them very similarly, but if you're trying to do diagnostic, diagnostics, um, that's one of the key criteria, and I'll talk about that with calcium channel blockers, why that's different here in a second. Activated charcoal, definitely if they meet the time frame, you'd want to give it. Um, fluids, one milligram IV atropine boluses. Atropine can help with, or fluids can help with the hypotension. Atropine can help with the bradycardia, but ultimately it's just a Band-Aid. Um, if the person's ingested enough and it's early in the presentation, they're going to start deteriorating. So getting some um, decontamination in them, so getting the activated charcoal in them is going to do a lot of benefit in those early stages if you can. Now, if you're beyond that window or the patient's sedated and out of it and already severely hypotensive and bradycardic, you can try fluids and atropine. Uh, but it's not really going to do a lot. It might buy you enough time to get your insulin drip ready. So that's the big thing we treat with these is insulin, high-dose insulin therapy. I'll talk a little bit more about it on a separate slide here in a second with the history on it and some of the mechanisms or proposed mechanisms. But you give one unit per kilo IV regular bolus, which is a ton of insulin. So think about like a DKA patient or hyperkalemic patient. You might give them like 10 units of insulin push. These patients could get 70, 100 units of insulin push. It's a ton of insulin. Um, and then a huge, huge infusion rate. So two kilo, unit per kilo per hour up to. Um, usually these patients are getting IV dextrose too. So remember they're hypo or euglycemic when they come in generally. So we want to make sure we aren't totally bottoming out their blood sugars. Um, IV glucagon, something that's been studied too. It has a similar um, concept. And I'll, I'm not going to talk about that as much. IV glucagon is difficult to obtain in the quantities to you need to prepare. And it insulin is just much more effectively studied and much more easily to obtain. It's a cheaper 
um, therapy. So we have more evidence associated, more comfort, I think, with insulin at this point. Other things you can try, IV calcium, sodium bicarbonate can help with the um, arrhythmia component and cardiac membrane stabilization. And um, a lot of beta blockers have a lipophilic profile, so IV lipid emulsion can help create a lipid sink in the patient and possibly absorb some of that. Um, propranolol specifically is really lipophilic. That's one of the ones that